Hi, I'm Jess, and I have a fan whore membership on Patreon. I have been a longtime listener to the Man Whore Podcast, and after hearing about all the benefits I could receive, I couldn't help but join up. I strongly believe that Billy creates quality content that appeals to many different kinds of people, and that type of art is so important in this day and age. So I personally pledge $10 a month to the Man Whore Podcast. Not only does that include a monthly naughty haiku from Billy via snail mail, the Stay Slutty button, but also access to all of the really sexy people in the peep show. I can't explain how awesome it is to be a Patreon and to support Billy and the Man Whore Podcast. The bonus content and episodes are always interesting, funny, and entertaining. So what are you waiting for? Just like Billy told me, scrounge up the change in your couch and pledge. Trust me, it's worth it. Even if it's just for the Titty Tuesday picks. Welcome to the Man Whore Podcast. To the man haters, boy bashers, and dick stompers, I get it. This is Billy Presida, and you're listening to the Man Whore Podcast. Okay, everyone, how you doing? Welcome to the show. Uh, This week, I have on fellow funny person and author of the book, How to Date Men (laughs) When You Hate Men, Blythe Robertson, everybody. And I cannot wait to share her with y'all in a bit. But first, you know what it is. Show dates, people. Show dates. Uh, Tomorrow, March 28th, I'm going to be at the Bell House at 8 p.m. doing a really fun one-liner comedy competition. I encourage everyone to come on out uh, if you can, if you're in the Brooklyn area. It's a really fun show. It's a really fun hang afterwards. Go check out the Man or Podcast Facebook page to find uh, a ticket link for that. But you know what I really want to tell you about. Tour to Man Whore, everybody. Yeah, you've got just a few days left to make a Man Whore Podcast live show happen in a city near you. I want to update y'all uh, with the, the ticket amounts needed in the various cities. So listen up to hear your city called San Francisco, Oakland. You already know you got a show coming to you, so stay tuned for that. But here are the other cities and what you need. Detroit, you need five tickets. Dallas, seven tickets to go. Chicago, honestly, I really thought Chicago was going to get there already, but you just need eight more tickets, baby. Miami needs 10 more tickets. Washington, D.C. needs 12 more, Uh, both Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. I'm going to come to you if you can sell just 13 more tickets. Uh, Memphis, you got 14 left to go. Portland, 15 tickets. Minneapolis, 16 tickets. Vancouver and Boston both need 17 tickets for a show to come on out over there. Uh, And then Toronto, Los Angeles, Austin, Atlanta, y'all need 18 tickets. And you've got just a few more days left to make it happen. So go on over to manwhorepod.com slash tour. Get your ticket today. And don't worry if you're feeling a little antsy, like, oh, I don't know. If your city is not activated, you will get a refund. But if we don't sell enough of these pre-sale tickets in your city, I ain't coming at all. So show me that you want me. So There's so many cities that are just so, so close to hitting it. All right, today is uh, is Wednesday the 27th, and uh, you have till Sunday night, the 31st. So go on over to manwhorepod.com slash tour. Get your tickets today. And if you want to stay up to date for the, the latest Manwhore Podcast nudes, head on over to manwhorepod.com. Uh, you'll see a, a sign-up button for the mailing list. It's a good thing to be on. Every once in a while, I give away some free shit. And it's a really good way to stay up to date with all the latest Manwhore Podcast news. Because, hey, look, I get it. Sometimes you fall a little bit behind listening to episodes. Maybe maybe you batch them up for like a fun road trip. I do that too. That doesn't mean you should uh, you know you should be uh, late on any of the the hip new announcements I got happening. So get on that mailing list and importantly, put in your zip code. So next time, you know we do a tour to Manhor, I, I know which cities I should be going to. Yesterday, I put out a bonus episode with fellow comedian Kevin Michael Smith. Uh, we <laughs> we recount a special night we shared together. 
special, awkward, you pick the adjective, with a past guest from this show. I don't know how many of y'all remember Lily. That's an old one. That's episode 97. Well, in there, we talk about a threesome she kind of tried to spring on me. And, well, this is the guy she tried to spring it on me with. Totally forgot who he was. Um, And then (laughs) ran into him in the comedy scene. And he reminded me. I was like, oh, fuck, dude, I've been trying to find you. So that was fun, but I I did ask Kevin to uh, help me out with an email question I got. I got an advice email from a listener uh, about some manscaping, so let's go uh, get some trimming tips with Kevin Michael Smith. All right, so I'm here right now with uh, fellow comedian Kevin Smith or, or Kevin Michael Smith, yes. uh, depending how you're searching on <laughs> Google. Uh, we just finished recording a really fun little bonus episode on Patreon. Uh, if, if you're already a patron, you'll have heard that yesterday. Uh, but Kevin, hey, how you doing? Hey, how's it going, everybody? Yeah, uh, Ke- Kevin and I were bamboozled into the same threesome that we didn't know about. <laughs> it then didn't happen, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, I did my best. You know, if I could have, if I was more comfortable it, around another male comedian. Listen, it's okay. Yeah. It's <laughs> you, fine by me. <laughs> you see, Yeah, you seemed very, in retelling it, we you seemed very relieved that you didn't have to have a threesome with me. Yeah. And I agree. I think uh, anyone who has to... Uh, have a threesome with me or have sex with me it's best that you don't in my opinion uh but i've got this uh advice email from someone who calls himself uh from a guy named darius and i want to get your advice as a fellow man person sure. fellow bearded basically you have all the same hair as me but it's all more impressive and full <laughs> i appreciate it. um all right so it's uh the title is about shaving advice okay Hi, my name is Darius, and I'm not sure if this is the place to ask, but what machine, Hmm. what machine would you recommend for someone trying to shave their privates? Like, what tool works best? He is very polite about it. He says, again, let me know if this is the right place to be asking such a question. (laughs) Otherwise, I can speak to someone else. (laughs) Thank you, and have a pleasant day. Saying have a pleasant day is such a polite way to uh, sound (laughs) off. Uh, but other than the fact that I find it terrifying that he's uh, asking for machine references. Yeah, yeah. I mean, technically a razor is a machine, but yeah. it, it, I'm scared to think of the concept of machine anywhere near my junk. Yeah, I don't. I tried that once, like the, the actual buzzer, <laughs> and it just it doesn't feel too good. No, you didn't? No. Oh, that's why I Especially do. on the ball. Like, well, yeah, it just hurts. Oh, not on the balls. Dude, yeah. What are you, crazy? It's too sensitive down there, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> what, 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 do you use, what do you do for manscaping? What do you use? Are you, you Just a regular razor, just a bick. Just a regular straight razor. Yeah, just that. Yeah? <laughs> just got to be careful. But how do you do to trim down? Um, like yeah, when, do when, the, when the bush gets high, how do you cut it down with the razor? Uh, you can still use the razor. Wow. Wait, uh-huh. How? Just cut it with the. the you just razor. like go through the bush, or like not to. Is this to go bare or just to shorten it? Just to shorten, yeah. See, I understand trying to go bare to shorten it. I guess. Well, you. I guess you just whack away. It's. Yeah, I guess I'm pretty lazy. Like you just. It's kind of. You go through the bush, yeah, but you, you don't go of... down to the base. Right. Exactly. Okay. Now I used to. I, I had a couple of mishaps with Nair, so I don't. That back in my early twenties. <laughs> my roommate's been telling me I should try Nair, it's and just... I've been having an issue where when I shave that inguinal area, you know, the ingu- it's what? the space that crease between like the thigh and like Uh-oh. your balls. I think that's called ing- maybe it's not. I've never no, heard that before. <laughs> no, actually, I think this ab, oh, this, this the, ab, the abdominals, the inguinal, whatever that <laughs> crease where my balls and thigh mesh together. <laughs> that so when I shave that. Sometimes I don't know what sort of bacterial nonsense happens, but like I get a fishy aroma. Oh, so yeah. my roommate was like, "You should try Nair." Okay, but now you're saying you had it. What? Well, I just if you leave it on too long, it'll just leave a burn. Like ah, a red, yeah, <laughs> like a red. <laughs> like, is it still there from like three years? No, ago? No, no, it's okay. just it goes away within the day. But it's just like I did it. Yeah, it was does Nair good. hurt? It. Well, if you have to really be like. Get it off right in the perfect amount of time. Okay. Or else it's going to burn. Yeah. And so it basically just burns the hair off. Uh, I guess it goes into like the follicles and you just wipe it away. So okay. it seems like super easy when you like think about it, but then you, if you leave it on too long, it's just like just leaves a huge red mark. And you would go bare. So you used to go bare down below. I d- just tried it a couple times. Tried yeah. it a couple just times. When in my early 20s. How like. did that play? Did you also <laughs> have the big beard? No, that was, I think that was before then. Because I yeah. can imagine like how. 
sh- jarring that could be False for advertising. Yeah, <laughs> like she's like, oh, he's got all that hair on his face. He's got all the chest there, the arms, and then baby <laughs> down below, baby smooth. <laughs> should try that just to see the reaction so you're just you're just whacking away with a razor hoping for the best uh do you do yeah. the balls uh yeah also with the razor do you do the taint yeah do you do the asshole uh i don't because when it grows back it starts it feels very uncomfortable it uh-huh. starts to grow back so i just leave it okay yeah and but all the time it's always with a straight razor yeah it's mostly out of laziness, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I have a beard trimmer, right? And I will use that to like get the bush area down. Mm-hmm. And then like I just haven't gone bare in a year and a half since I did body painting. But oh, okay. um so I just get that to shorten it, but then I'll use the razor for like um the balls and that side spot on the taint right, right. and the and backside and everything. I don't use i'm not a monster i don't use my regular razor for my face for that <laughs> yeah so when the, fa- the one when the, the razor for my face is done i take it off that becomes the manscaping razor okay and then when that one's fully done then we rotate them out and yeah, i just you take keep- it off what do you mean you take it off I th- the- so i have uh, cuz oh, i have like a sure. harry's razor blade uh, so like I have the 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 handle. Oh, the handle you keep. I take yeah no the hand. So I just take the razor blade off the handle, and then that goes into the shower oh. for manscaping. Aren't you concerned that it's not uh sharp enough? It's gonna be like cause a, b- a bump. Or- uh, I don't understand fully how razors work, <laughs> but I have not worried about that. It hasn't oh. been too much of an issue. So, uh, but we would agree, uh, machines. If you're using the word machine, oh. it might be the the wrong machine. Um, yeah. If if it's big enough that it could be called a machine, maybe it's <laughs> not the right machine for you. You could use like maybe I mean I haven't done it, but it's just like a beard trimmer that has like a uh, the length thing, or you could you could do like a, a yeah. four inch yeah or whatever inch you want. Yeah, uh, that's why I use. I recommend okay. that. Yeah, so you get, have the blade the the, the um, whatever the little th- the, the little extended. filters with the, oh, okay whatever yeah. those are called. Yeah, that sounds that's amazing. Yeah, get one of those, dude. Get like a beard trimmer at your CVS, and then just you know. Yeah, don't do Use what that. I do. It's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> I also recommend though you shave down on the on the on the on the um, on the shaft. You shave down to the base. Oh yeah, of course. Of course, right. Of course. I don't think everyone thinks. Of course, I don't think everyone's thinking this through. <laughs> I think a lot. I think there's a lot of men out there losing half an inch by not <laughs> working on the shaft. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Kevin, where can people follow you on social media? Um, Instagram is Kevin Michael S. Kevin Michaels. And, and you uh, have a you have a Friday show at uh, here in New York City every week, right? Yeah, every Thursday or every Friday uh, at eight thirty at Beauty Bar. Yeah, Beauty Bar, good spot on Fourteenth Street, everybody. Uh, if you want to hear some more with me and Kevin, uh, we're gonna recount this uh, surprise failed threesome. Uh, it's already available on Patreon to all of my five dollar and up members. Uh, but for now, why don't you go ahead and say goodbye to everybody? Thanks, everybody. And if you want to send me a comment, a question, titty pictures, you know, whatever, send them on over to manwhorepod at gmail.com. Uh, if you haven't been able to tell, the, the subtle theme this month has been Patreon. And I've been just absolutely overwhelmed by like all the new patrons who signed up this month. We have so many new people. It's, it's so great. I'm so thrilled. You know, one thing I haven't really explained, though, uh, recently is... That not only do pledges give me a validation for the work that I'm doing, but they have a very real effect on my quality of life. One of my proudest uh, and scariest moments was quitting my day job at In Touch Weekly to pursue the Man or Podcast full time. Many people would not uh, advise me to make that business decision, <laughs> but I did it anyway. Due to a, a unique, we'll call it, rent situation at my old apartment, I felt like it was a it was a good time to give it a try. And the main reason I was able to take that leap of faith was the growing community of listeners supporting this podcast. Yep, on Patreon. And by the way, I was I was also able to make that leap of faith because of fans who bought merch, fans who came to live events, fans who bought me stuff off my Amazon wish list. You're all fantastic. But, you know, see, now that I'm in a real apartment, uh, you know, one that doesn't have dead animals in the ceiling and has working bathrooms, my cost of living has gone up. I'm not living in luxury over here. You know, I do have three roommates, but I am in a safe housing situation. 
Longtime listeners know uh, that wasn't always the case. Unfortunately, this means I have to hustle some side jobs to make ends meet. That's because, you know, well, this is a free podcast, right? This is a free podcast that you get to enjoy. That means I need to rely on people who believe that creators should be paid for the work that they do, even if that means throwing me one dollar one time. And your fan whore memberships go towards keeping a roof over my head, food in my belly, and condoms on my cock. Right now, we're about $200 away from the podcast covering my basic living expenses. That's my rent, that's my utilities, my internet, my metro card. These are real things your money helps me pay for. Not, it's not just figurative support. As more and more of you join our sex positive groups like the Champagne Room and the Peep Show, I will feel less pressure to do random side hustles that take time away from me doing stand up and working on this podcast. That means more time making entertaining content for you. As of this recording, we're sitting at 160 patrons. I would love, 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 love to reach 200 patrons by my five-year anniversary on April 16th. Yes, I know. I have been doing this for five years. I think that's crazy, too. Do you think we can hit that? Do you think we can do that? 200 patrons? 40 more? Awesome fan whores willing to throw down at least one buck a month. I think I think we can do it. I think we together can reach that goal. I want to see more secret sluts in our secret Facebook group. I want to see such a long wait list for the peep show that I have to make a patient pervert waiting room. Like another kick group, like a must move table for any poker players out there. Not only will you be joining an amazing community of like-minded individuals, but you'll be supporting your favorite man whore. These dollars, they have a real-world effect on me and my life. One day, hopefully in the near future, I would like to be able to make enough on Patreon that I can afford to hire a second pair of hands to help me with the show. Hashtag hire Mia. I would love to hashtag hire Mia. I think that'd be great. So visit patreon.com slash podcast and become a member today. As of April 1st, membership begins at $2 a month. But if you join now, you can get grandfathered into an amazing community for just a dollar. So just try it. One dollar, one time. That is all I will ever ask of you. One dollar, one time. Again, visit patreon.com slash manwhore podcast. That's patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash manwhore podcast. And hey, even if you don't want to pledge, go to my Patreon page anyway, click follow so you don't miss the free monthly bonus episodes that will be starting very soon. Uh, this week's guest is Blythe Robertson. As you know, she's got this book out now. It's called uh, How to Date Men When You Hate Men. I saw the title and was like, you, I choose you. I want to talk to you. After recording this, I did kind of sort of meditate on the, on what my reactions were like and what was it, what it was like for me in that recording, because in that recording, Blythe is certainly not shy about calling me out or disagreeing with me, which I love. I wish I had more guests on who disagree with me. It really felt like, you know, there, there's there's moments in this where, like, she really does go ahead and, and check my privilege. And it's amazing, um, my defensiveness. You know, for example, you, you tell someone that they're sexist, what instantly they're going to go, I'm not sexist. It's like when you tell someone they're racist, they're like, I'm not racist. I don't lynch black people, so I'm not racist. Like, anything short of that bar, you couldn't possibly be. So I don't know. Am I sexist? Yeah, probably. There's, there's, or or there's at least some ingrained sexist undertones. Things I gotta you know think about day to day, and check myself on, and and have people like Blythe check me on as well. So if if you're listening to this and you're like, wow, Billy's like being really defensive or interrupting, it's like I I hear that too. And that's something I'm always thinking about and trying to do better on and you know i hope you think about your reactions too so whether you're a dude who gets called out for being sexist or you're a white lady who gets told she's a little racist or whatever it is um even if that person is ultimately wrong in what they're saying there is value in thinking about the merits of what they're saying 
They might be completely right. They might be partially right. They might be dead fucking wrong. But I challenge everyone to, uh, you know, when when you get that impulsive knee-jerk reaction where you're like, oh, I got to defend myself, just, you know, sit with it. Or if you do do what I do in this episode where you get kind of defensive at moments and times, try to reflect on that afterwards and try to find, try to call yourself out on that before someone else does. I don't know. I'm probably rambling. Uh, but anyways, you know, Blythe is, she is fantastic. She is so much fun. Uh, very funny. I, I really want to check out this book. I hope you enjoy her, but let's go ahead and get to my conversation with Blythe Robertson. Yeah. That, what was that? Uh, Sonnet 116, Shakespeare. <laughs> That's one to pull out for a sound check. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you will want to keep like in front. Uh, otherwise, this okay. will you will lose the sound yeah. very easily. Okay, cool. So right here. Yeah. Wait, what, what is that sonnet? <laughs> uh, sonnet 116. Have you seen Sense and Sensibility? Nah. Uh, okay. Um, have you ever eaten those chocolates that have little poems inside? They're like... I've eaten lots this of chocolates. Big. I'm just yeah, trying yeah, to go yeah. through my Rolodex of <laughs> yeah. chocolates I've eaten. <laughs> yeah, they're the ones that are like they come in a bunch of different colors. Like the whole wrapper is a different. This is so stupid. There's this is a long walk to no payoff. But uh, <laughs> there's it, this brand of chocolate that has poems inside, and one of the chocolates has that poem inside as well. That's intense for chocolate. Yeah, I, I know, right? <laughs> don't want to yeah. eat chocolate and read some masterful piece of poetry. Yeah, well, that's the whole. I mean, the brand has said it's good chocolate, but the other part of the brand is that each chocolate has a love poem inside. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that's a good time, Samson. That is it. Is it Blythe? Blythe, yes. I go up with the Blythe, not Blythe. Uh, I guess this <laughs> yeah. is Blythe. But uh, a lot of people call me Blythe. Like my manager calls me Blythe. And I don't think they know that it's different, but I don't care. <laughs> well, I'm with uh, Blythe Ro- Ro- Roberson, um, <laughs> author of uh, How to Date Men When You Hate Men. And I guess the first question I just need to ask is why do you hate men? Uh, have you heard of patriarchy? <laughs> <sighs> Can you spell that one? <laughs> what? Um... <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, so we live in a society that... Uh, for thousands of years has been set up to benefit men wildly like women were basically property didn't have access to education um, jobs couldn't own their own property had no access to you know reproductive rights the good days yeah <laughs> so yeah so we live in the society that women are oppressed by men still in many ways large and small and so how to date men when you hate men is about you know being a horned up perv you know trying to date men when also they are your oppressors so but also with jokes and you know good okay yeah uh where where did the idea for that come from uh i was i knew i wanted to write a book um but i and i knew that the i was writing a lot of new yorker pieces and the pieces that were about my dating life kind of like obscured but inspired by my dating life resonated with people obscured but inspired by yeah yeah so not just like this fucking guy blah 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 but you know just like a mckinsey report the first one my first new yorker piece was uh this guy had like i'd been seeing him for a long time he kept on being like i can't be in anything serious right now i can't date anyone and i was like that's fine um i went away for a weekend came back i was like hey let's hang out and he was like I started dating someone. So Mm. I like woke up my male roommate who was a consultant and I was like, he's very happy. He's been with the same girl since like our freshman year of college. And I was like, Todd, I wish you could like be a consultant on my dating life. And then I was like, oh, that would be a good comedy piece. So like that was my first piece that sold to the New Yorker, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, okay, I'm going to write a dating book because that's the content that people like. Um, And then I kind of was like, but uh, the longest thing I'd ever written was like 12 pages in college, which like should be illegal that they let me graduate. (laughs) Yeah. So I was like, okay, what the heck can I write that is not going to be a novel? Uh, So then I had this book, A Lover's Discourse by Roland Barthes. He's like a french philosopher i guess from like the 70s and he takes words and phrases associated with love this is such a long walk to get to how i came up with this book uh so words like jealousy waiting engulfment and he writes in fragments about his own thoughts and you know literature other philosophy um and each chapter was like three to five pages and i was like that is a number of pages i can write so i was like 
I want to write that book, but modern and feminist and with jokes. So right. that's what I tried to write. Also, if you add how to to your topic automatically, it's like, no, that's a book. Yeah, exactly. That's a book yeah, you yeah, could yeah, do. yeah. 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 But that, no, that's great. I'm having a hard time writing my how to throw a gangbang pamphlet. <laughs> I'm having a hard time sitting down just to bang that out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's got to be different. Wait, so have you. I've been hearing this a lot. And actually, I, I was um, a listener was in like a little group chat where we were talking about this, where she keeps running these guys who go like, oh, um, and she loves to just like she's down to just fuck. She is down for an open relationship or uh-huh. to fuck around like she's certainly not being like, mm, where's my husband? Yeah. But these dudes will say, I don't want to date. Yeah. But I do want to keep having a sexual relationship. And then I also want these things and the things will all be a relationship yeah. without saying it's a relationship. Yeah. And I've been trying to advise her, eh, stop messing with these dudes because yeah. they're just trying to have it all on their terms and not yours. And like, it's what tough. The- I mean, I have been on the opposite side of that as well, where it's just like, I don't know. I think there's something so uh, like defined about dating in a way that you're like, well, I like I write about this in my book where I'm like, I always am a person who like wants to build their own poke bowl. And then I end up with a poke bowl that ends like costs fourteen dollars and smells like a fart and i'm like i should have just fucking like bought a pokeball that they created and i feel like it's the same with dating where i'm like i feel like i can just make like a model of human connection that's better than like boyfriend girlfriend um because that comes with all these like crazy weird connotations um so i get the impulse of being like well we're not dating but here's what i want but it always really just ends up like being kind of basically a relationship, but like less healthy because you think not labeling it will save you in some way. But then they'll give you all of that and then they'll do what this dude did with you where then they do find the person yeah. that they want to call girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. It and sucks. It's, like, yeah. Like, it's almost as if they want you as like this emotional and sexual placeholder until yeah, like they find the one that they yeah. can bring home the mom. Yeah. It's not healthy. Yeah. My fr- I this relationship I was in that was like that recently ended like a different iteration and my friend wait the most recent thing that ended the, so i was i was, was the thing you just described before oh or? different different, different, different. Okay, yeah. okay yeah a lot of things ending for me right now uh but yeah <laughs> oh, no. i know i know <laughs> wild up people in my life uh but yeah my best friend emmy was like you thought yeah that not being boyfriend and girlfriend would like make it easier when it ends but that's not true yeah yeah um i like the concept of building the own poke like treating a relationship like building your own poke bowl, although I don't know what a poke bowl is. Really? I know that it's a food. Yeah. Because yeah. I passed by the one on Fourth Avenue that is frustrating, not, not a Pokemon Go yeah. second spot, yeah. which yeah. is weird. But so I understand that's a food thing. Do you want to know what it is? I I don't see the thing is I don't eat Asian food, so I already know what? I don't what do you eat? Why does everyone give me everyone I go I out with? I only will be like... eat Asian food. I only eat <laughs> Asian food. But also I'm like kill me vegan so like Ugh. it's good for being vegan i like but i like that you don't even like that you're vegan <laughs> yeah. you're like kill me yeah. i'm vegan uh, i'm sorry yeah no I, I it makes dating hard because women will instantly go if i knock off a whole continent yeah they'll be like well what do you eat and i'll be like the rest of the world everything else what like what did you eat yesterday for dinner I, I I just appreciate that you think I space it out like a meal. <laughs> it's when I can nervously eat things before 10 p.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I eat burgers. I'm a very beige diet. It's okay. a lot of oh, no. carbs, yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah. meat, a lot of killing innocent no, creatures no. with souls. <laughs> No. And it, here's the weird thing. If the animal was a good animal, no. it tastes a little better. No, it no, does. It no. Really does. I can sense it. I'd be like, mm, this one This one would stick up for the runt. Mm. Oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> I have to go. Um, but I do like training a relationship, custom, like customizing yeah. it uh, and be like, oh, no, no, you can make it however you want to be. I guess my question is when you say you have in your mind your custom Poke Bowl relationship is this before the rela- a relationship has started or is this, no, this is what I want in one and now we got to go find someone for it? No, the, yeah, this is while it's happening. Like trying okay. to define it as it's going along, like based on what both of you want. But then the problem is it just requires like a lot of checking in and a lot of communication and like that is hard for everyone. Uh, yeah, so that's yeah, where Yeah, but that's a relationship. That's, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it's like <laughs> there's this like Seneca quote where it's like it takes a whole life to learn how to live and I feel like it's 
the same for dating. You really are a New Yorker <laughs> writer. You have quotes for everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, yeah. I mean, look, relationships, whether it's monogamous and standard or super customizable, are always going to be uh, yeah. difficult because you got to talk to each other. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the answer. Like most of the any like advice, most advice questions I've gotten will be, ah, bah, 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 and I'll just be like, have you? told them or asked them and yeah. they'll be like no that's terrifying and yeah like, i don't know the answer but they do yeah have fun Oof. yeah that's so real have you had a uh, a relationship connect before like have you had like a quote-unquote proper relationship however you define no that? i mean i i certainly have had people that i really care about um for a long period of time. Yeah. Is that your boyfriend? Is that your girlfriend? No, it's just a person I really <laughs> I care really about. Care about. Yeah. So, hi Kenzie, how you doing? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh no, but I've never called someone my boyfriend or yeah, no. So no to that question. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Uh I think I yeah, by the time that I like got to you know dating people long term and like seriously i was like so i don't want to say like radicalized but just so much like i'm not looking for the conventional thing that like if i had been a teen and like the boy that i liked had liked me i would have been like we're boyfriend girlfriend like let's make it official on facebook and now i'm like not fucking on facebook you know I'm just, i like, noticed <laughs> yeah trying to be like oh what mutual friends we got she, yeah. she don't exist. Yeah. I, I now I have to check Instagram to see who I know that's following them on Instagram. And I know that Instagram, hello listeners, is owned by the same people that own Facebook. But I love Instagram and I can't get off it. Yeah. <sighs> I, I want to go back, but they took me down. Instagram? I've been off Instagram three months. Why? Uh, sexual content. Um, wait, so when you say you want something uh, not conventional... Yeah. I I mean, you already refer to yourself as a perv and you kind of let that like sli- you let <laughs> Three that slide. Question marks. Yeah, cuz like, yeah. I mean like you you don't look like what people think <laughs> is perv, but my knowledge of like the people I see at play parties, you very easily could be <laughs> an incognito pervert. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just think a perv is a funny word and I think that like there's a lot of uh not shame but it's like very taboo almost to talk about female desire in any way like active female desire uh which is like changing there's a lot of like like i love dick the book and the tv show i feel like we're big on like there's a wave of women who like actively express desire but i think it's funny to like be a woman and self-identify as a perv i feel like it freaks people out sure i mean so do you do you just call yourself a perv because you want you like freaking people out or is that actually a uh, thing you think is accurate. I think for it's yourself. just funny. Yeah, I would say it's like mostly a funny thing I do. But you know, God bless anyone who like uh genuinely thinks they're a perv. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also it's just like such a pejorative term that like that anyone would identify as it. I think this is truly like poking a dead frog, like you know, like looking at a joke until it's not funny anymore. But I just think it's like a funny thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Um relationships for you are they still monogamous are they still like opposite sex are they still like traditional yeah i uh i so we're we live in hookup culture right where like it's totally fine and normal to be dating multiple people at a time i mean i think that's because we live in a metropolis i I do not think that is at all the widespread yeah dating culture because we live in new york city where is a very different dating scene than Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah, I wonder if that someone should go to Omaha and interview people. Yeah, because I mean, it definitely is like there's so many choices. Um, we have so many choices, but we're also in a way more like not just politically liberal, but sexually yeah. liberal area. I yeah. mean, because they're definitely like conservative cities in Florida, but like they've totally have swinger scenes. And yeah, everything. yeah. I mean, I went to a swinger fucking uh, resort in Mexico and almost everyone there from the South, Texas yeah. and like, Wow. Ohio. Like it yeah. was so much. I was like, how many of these people people are secretly Republicans? Yeah. I was like, because you all know the people you vote against are the ones who la- laid the groundwork for you to even do this shit. Yeah. Um that's wild. So so I don't find I find when people say like, oh, well, we're in we're in this like whatever, or we're in hookup culture. I go like, I don't think that's I think yeah. we are in hookup culture. Yeah. I don't think I mean, you know Idaho is. I also I want to push back on that a little bit because Please. like i mean i would be again very interested i'm just like there are all these articles that people need to write <laughs> i feel like people do uh i mean i'm from like 
the Midwest, like Illinois, Wisconsin. And I feel like people assume that people there are like less hip or like less, I don't know, progressive culturally than other people are. But like we're all on the same internet, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Although like also I was talking to my agent um, and she was like, no one in Milwaukee has read Cat Person. And I was like, that's so offensive. People what, in Milwaukee. What is Cat Person? Oh, my God. Cat Person is the New Yorker short story that went viral. Oh, that thing? Yeah. I didn't read it, but, oh my God. you know. It's good. You should read it. So I was like, that's so <laughs> fucking offensive that you would think that no one in Milwaukee has read Cat Person. It was viral online. And then I asked my best friend who lives in Milwaukee, like, have you read Cat Person? And she was like, no. So maybe... Maybe I'm thinking that people are, you know, more progressive than they are. But I would say I don't say offhand that people in Idaho aren't dating multiple people at the same time. I think it's very possible that they are. Mm -hmm. uh, but I certainly am. Uh, but I but in a way that it's like, well, when I if I decide that I want to date one of these people, I will start to only date them because uh, I feel like. But yeah, I don't know. It's interesting that you can like perform polyamory in a way, but I feel like being poly you have to be like i am poly this is a person that i am and it's a different thing than being like i'm dating multiple people but eventually i'm trying to get down to just one yeah, yeah. um and, and that's even different from the people who are like i'm not monogamous but i'm not polyamorous it's yeah uh, i mean so i i personally move but i kind of go between the two i can't tell because i haven't successfully been polyamorous i've been very successfully non-monogamous is polyamorous the idea that you're in multiple relationships at a time it's the it's the concept more that you're not you don't have to be in multiple relationships to be poly but part of being poly is just you're open to love is not a finite resource you can be in love with more than like having mm -hmm. multiple romantic connect uh connections or at least just acknowledging you could yeah. because when i was in a polyamorous relationship uh i didn't actually have another girlfriend but i did date and i did sleep around mm -hmm. but it, it was out there is like it's possible i will meet someone who i also want to establish a romantic connection with yeah that's kind of what that's about totally. um, and since i haven't successfully gotten two women dumb enough to fall in love with me <laughs> it's only kind of really been one at a time yeah i i don't really know so i i, I waver between the two things um interesting cool yeah but but that I find that separate from the people who do go. What is what I think is part of hookup culture is the idea of like I'm gonna hook up, not even date, but it's like I'm hooking up with a bunch of people until yeah. like the sales funnel gets me <laughs> down to like my final sale, like at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. You starve with a bunch of matches, and then you work through people you give your number to, and then the people you date, then the people you're fucking, and then eventually there's one winner. And yeah. for me, I'm just like, look, whoever ends up at the bottom of that funnel, I am just happy you're here. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sales funnel is a great metaphor for it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, for hookup culture, like, specifically. Yeah. Um, you said you grew up in, like, Illinois, comma, Wisconsin, or Illinois and Wisconsin? Yeah, so... Th uh, the Midwest can be weird like that when they name their cities. They'll <laughs> yeah. be like, yeah, I live in New York, you know, Ohio. Yeah, uh, there's a Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, I So my this is so boring. My parents are divorced. My mom lives in Illinois, uh, Antioch, Illinois, which is the town that if you literally go like two streets up from my high school, you're in Wisconsin. It's the last town before Wisconsin. And then my dad lives in or lived in, he retired to Florida, uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, which is like a half hour drive from Antioch. Um, so I kind of grew up, they had joint custody. So I grew up in both. And I used to oh. just say Illinois, but then everyone was like, oh, Chicago. And then I was like, yeah. And, and then, then people Wisconsin. were like, oh, fuck you. It wasn't Wis uh, Chicago. It was Antioch. Did you see the Fred Armisen special by chance? No. Oh, it's called Stand for Drummers. You don't really need to watch the whole special, but yeah. like 12 minutes in, he does a bit where he does all of the accents of the country pretty much oh with my a god map. but he gets to chicago he's like chicago in chicago <laughs> is it the car car chicago but but then wisconsin's more chicago than chicago <laughs> and i die every time <laughs> oh my god i have to watch that stand up for drummers uh yeah fred armiston special yeah so yeah. what was like the dating what was like what's young Blythe up to like growing up <laughs> yeah. what sort of sex ed are we getting what dating sphere are we get in yeah we're, we're all the guys all over you we're none of the guys all over yeah, you. yeah like, yeah uh none yeah i uh yeah no i just want to learn where, where did you first start hating men that's what i'm trying to <laughs> track this back to you know that's a great question <laughs> i i mean oh my god when did i first i feel like i'll give you an answer and then like i'll realize uh 
that it was actually like five years before that, uh, like three days from now. But I definitely realized like, oh my God, feminism is a thing. And this is like woefully late uh, and woefully a stupid origin story. But I was in a um, fucking screenwriting seminar in college and they were like, okay, this week, right? a script about something an issue that you really care about and i was like what issues do i care about because i was super political in high school and then i got to college and i was like these people are smarter than me they're gonna fix all the problems i thought it was gonna be on me to fix i don't have to care about this stuff anymore um and obama was president so everything seemed great so i was like (laughs) what do i care about and then i was like reading this book by catlin moran uh a british feminist uh music critic and writer um And I was like, oh, fuck, like there's so much that I never realized was like a feminist issue. Like, you know, women like like even the beauty myth, like women having to look a certain way, like all this like public criticism of Diana, like wanting to be a princess, blah, 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 wanting to get married. Uh, So I was like, holy fucking shit, like feminism is a thing. And like I was at that point, like 20 years old. I was like Mm. way too late to be realizing that patriarchy exists. But yeah, that's when I was like, really? I found that that's the prime time you discover this. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, because I mean, we're like, the high school in the Midwest. Like, that's what? True. And when you're a teen, you're so like in it of just like trying to be a normal person in any way, like trying to fit in, like trying to learn what the mores are. Um, yeah, that even like there's this, I'm going to totally m- miss name this person. There's this American uh, sociologist who lives in France named Harold or Howard. Becker or Baker or something, and he <laughs> wrote in the fifties or sixties. Sure. Uh, yeah. Four possible names there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, Google it, friends. Uh, he wrote in the fifties or sixties about deviants, like about people. sexual deviants. No, no. Well, oh, so, but I, I'm sure you could apply this to that. He hung out a lot in like jazz clubs and wrote about people who used um marijuana uh i know crazy crazy stuff and he was like but you think of them as these deviants back then but even within this deviant culture there are social mores and like they have their own culture and they have their own rules so which is all to say like even the teens who were like rebelling you know having like punk shows in basements they all had their own little rules and we're all trying to seem cool to each other just like a smaller microcosm Mm. yeah but wait, so well, you discover feminism in this, tw- you're at 20 in this screenwriting class and yeah. kind of what happens, what sparks the brain? Like, uh, did that become an identity for you? Did that, I mean, what? It just made me want to read more. I was like, oh my God, there are all of these thoughts that I never had and I never thought about any of this in this way. And so it's just every book I would read, I would write down all the books that they mentioned and go buy those books and read those books and then just constantly trying to be learning. You look like me in the in that you probably go to the back bibliography and circle shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm I'll, looking at, with the is, most with the bigger books. I'll I'll do that for sure. Yeah, this is great. This is a good collection. Oh, thank is there you. a rhyme or reason to how these are organized? Absolutely. Uh, at the top, you've got mostly like the comedy books. So like kind of they're kind of ba- basically memoirs. But all the memoirs I have are like comedy books. Yeah. You got Jesus, really into. Jesus as a historical figure. I haven't read a book about Jesus in, in years. Where's the Jesus section? I'm on the top shelf in the oh, middle. Oh, okay. So you got like Holy Blood, Holy Grail. You got a book on Mary Magdalene. When Jesus Became yeah. God, I really liked. Have you read Zealot by Reza Aslan? It's on my Amazon wish list. It's really good. I re- it I'm tore excited. my mom's book club apart. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you have like philosophy stuff from college that's just there. Uh-huh. Uh, Civilization's Discontents. I like that one. Then you got Sex is pretty much the entire, the next shelf. Uh, below that is like entertainment stuff. So like Bill Carter's books, which I love mm-hmm. on late night TV. You got like the SNL book, uh, some poetry anthology shit that I don't really touch. Mm-hmm. And then below you got history, which is mostly New York history, but just history. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the bottom is is fiction. Nice. And then up there you got like Harry Potter and like, you know, love it. Uh, Hunger Games shit like that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a rhyme. I need, I need another shelf. I'm a- yeah, so doing that's some always more. a problem. What, um, but yeah, but what was your big, like your biggest holy shit, what the fuck realization that you read <sighs> oh, in one of those book things that you know no what? one reads anymore? Uh, oh my God, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to, uh, this, I didn't read the beauty myth until way later, but I feel like uh, so many of the ideas from it were just permeated everything else. Like it was so influential. But yeah, the beauty myth by Naomi Wolf is just like, uh, I've never seen The Matrix, but I often feel like maybe this is what The Matrix is. Um, although so many fucking men's rights activists quote The Matrix on Reddit, then I'm like, maybe I'm totally 
You're saying the um, beauty myth was your red pill. Yeah, exactly. Where it's just like we there there is this idea of what a beautiful woman is that has nothing to do with actual women. Mm-hmm. It only has to do it's like a tool to control women to make them think about this thing all the time to like starve themselves to always be wrong, to always be trying to get to this ideal that they can't get to and then if they think about beauty all the time, they are seen as vain, right? So it's just like they're the it, it's this double bind created for women. And like one of the reasons we know that it has nothing to do with reality is that it's constantly changing. Mm. Um, Yeah. So it's just like, that was for me like, Oh, duh. Like this, like I've spent so much of my life hating my body and being terrified of it. Sorry. Uh, But yeah, like for no reason, it was just because I'm a woman and women are, oppressed you at know? 20 that was really like a revelation for you yeah i mean like this was later even than i read that book okay. but um yeah that j- i mean there are just so many things it's like when your oppression is so deeply woven into society there are so many ways you don't see it happening it's like that david foster wallace speech like this is water sure totally yeah. whatever that speech was <laughs> it was this he i don't read the new yorker like, oh my I, don't, God. Yeah, I was yeah, a new yeah. york magazine guy yeah. <laughs> He uh he gave a graduation speech at Kenyon and I was trying to quote this to someone else the other day and I was like, I don't know how to get from A to C, but he tells some joke about like two fish, I think. And one of the fish is like, hey, like water's pretty nice today. And the other fish is like, what's water? So the idea is like, I forget why he said this, but for me, it's like patriarchy is water. Like we're in it. So it's so around us it's so everything that we move through that it's hard to see it because it just is the water it's like the air that we're but then when you know what it is all you yeah, see you're is like it. water yes it's all you fucking see and yes. it's just so i mean on my end it's tiring so i don't even want to imagine what <laughs> yes, it is on your heart. yeah have you seen or heard of um heidi schreck's uh new play what the constitution means to me <laughs> Oh, it's so good. It's I'm very uncultured. I know there's a lot of books, <laughs> but that's about it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you got to see it. I see that you have one playbill here. It's transferred I mean, to Broadway. It's Hamilton. Which, I mean, uh, you don't have to be cultured to go to Hamilton. Yeah. It's no. rap. Uh, <laughs> but so, okay, so what the Constitution means to me, you have to see it. It's mm-hmm. previews March 14th. Write it down. Yes, good. Uh, so she, this woman, Heidi Streck, talks about the Constitution. She was like a junior debater. Um And she talks about uh, the 14th Amendment and kind of uses it as a tool to look at the history of, like, sexual violence in her family. Like, her great-great-great-grandmother was, like, a mail-order bride and died in a mental institution of melancholia at Mm. age 36. And, like, just all this horrible stuff that I I won't get into because it'll everyone will stop listening to the podcast because they'll be crying. Uh, But yeah, I only bring it up to be like, I never really considered the trauma of being a woman in this country until I watched this play and just like was kind of tearing up because like it sucks to hear stories of sexual violence, obviously. But then at the end of the play, she brings out this like teen to like debate her on like whether the Constitution should be abolished, like a real teen debater. And just like while that girl walked out, I started like heaving, sobbing, like truly like shaking. And I was just like, oh, right. Like this is what it feels like to consider for a second what it means to be a woman in this country. And like our country, I mean, sucks, but like our country is like a better than a lot of places in the world to like be a woman. So yeah, uh, which is all to say, patriarchy is everywhere, and it's very <laughs> tough. It's not fun. <laughs> Wait, but now the beauty myth, like, what that was that was a big revelation for you, apparently. Which again, I'm shocked because I felt like that was such a yeah. Like, don't, but so wait, was that something you were playing into a lot in high school? Because you you kind of glossed over the like, oh, you know, high school that was a thing. It happened. Oh yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. But well, I mean, it's just also like my like here how do i how do i put this like i was never a kid that like wore makeup i wasn't really like i want usually be... that kid is holding a copy of the beauty myth yeah, book yeah. at 14 that's right, why right. i'm just so shocked like yeah. it's, i'm not shocked that like a 20 year old woman didn't know that i was like i'm shocked you didn't know yeah that. <laughs> yeah and, it, and it's like my parents are like very uh like they encouraged me to read and they like my mom's a democrat it's just like it never came across and no one had ever recommended it to me and like yeah it just was like yeah i can't believe i didn't put everything together earlier but like 
I just didn't because we we live in a culture where women's magazines are telling you you have to look a certain way and rom-coms are telling you like, you know, all the celebrity women are like thin white, you know, like women with long hair wearing makeup and high heels like we have this Eurocentric, very feminized ideal of beauty and very thin, um, which is not like a coincidence that you know being thin means you never eat and you like are hungry all the time and thinking about that so yeah as a teen i wasn't even one of the i wasn't even a girl who wore a lot of makeup or was wearing high heels i don't understand shapes or colors so like my fashion was not great uh so what what were you rocking what did you look like yeah yeah, what was i wearing it was a lot of like honestly i (laughs) wore you know those like softy shorts like they're like you see a lot of cheerleaders in them they're like basically just like cotton shorts and then like shirts that i would buy at thrift stores that had like writing on them so like i had a 4-h shirt that i love so much uh that just like was green and had like a clover with the 4-h symbol on it that i was never in 4-h and people are always like oh my god 4-h and i was like i got this at a thrift store so i was just wearing like basically what would pass as pajamas all the time or like it looked (laughs) like i was gonna work out but i it wasn't gonna work out. Everyone's just like, "Oh, Blythe's so active! Like she's like <laughs> yeah, always exactly. on her way to the gym." <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was no. like, "Yeah, homies." Uh, yeah, but even so, even for me, I like didn't realize that I was like, you know, always like thinking about my diet because of the beauty myth. Because we are told that you're only attractive if you're like. Very wait, so you thin. Said, wait, you said you were thinking about it. You yeah, so about? I was. Yeah, and it's just like always, you know, feeling like I would. I didn't wear makeup, but I felt like I had to. So I would like have makeup and I would, you know, every once in a while try to do like an eyeshadow or like a lip color. And it was just like when I read the beauty myth, I was like, oh, duh. Like it's because we're it's so deeply ingrained. Whereas like men don't have to wear makeup, like unless they're we have different we have different physical concerns. We're like all worried and caught up in. And I'm not even talking about the dick stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Talking yeah. about the fact that like was it uh, like a third of boys, a third of young men uh, manage their weight with disordered eating as well. Yeah, it's but certainly no one like <laughs> yeah, it's definitely like the like and goal of feminism is not just like like oh my god like you know female empowerment. It's feminism like, benefits everybody. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, because the beauty myth I think would also then apply to dudes. Who, you know, they think like, oh, it's you got to have abs or got to do this. And yeah, I just think I think guys to be sexually attractive, we had a few extra non-physical outs than women yeah. like because you could be rich, you could be funny. But it's also like I definitely don't want to diminish the fact that like men do feel bad about their bodies and like men do have to like perform masculinity in a way that's mm-hmm. really broken and like that doesn't just uh denigrate women but like is bad for them as well but like it's different for women because like of the thin thing like literally we're not eating like and i i know you you say the like men disordered eating as well but it's just like it's just i feel like women are more harshly judged as well like women uh like talk, you, talk, you, go go to go to gram go to murray hill or gramercy yeah. go to a bar <laughs> Of the chicks who are the beauty myth, and then ask them their opinions on dudes with those, my body type, those, and then you'll be like, "Oh, they're women. We're just a lot more quiet about it." No, no, Slash no, y'all, no, are, no. y'all. No. Women, actually, I will say not quiet. Women can definitely you y'all can shit on dudes' body, and it's not a single issue with it. No, I completely disagree with everything you just said. Okay, so Bring let me it. just yes. go through. <laughs> Please. Okay, so a women up until the seventies could not own a credit card without their like husband's approval. Right. So like females looking a certain way has historically been far more weighted because if you're not fuckable, you literally starve to death. It's like every Jane Austen book is like, they're trying to get a husband because if they don't, they will die. Mm. Um, So it's way more weighted. I feel like women are called vain. If they are those women that you say like are hitting the mark. And even then we're told you don't look right. Um, There's no perfect, you know, no one can achieve that like beauty ideal because it's fake um and i think it's fucked up for anyone to talk to make fun of anyone's weight and i think that like it definitely is i work on a late night show and like people think it's okay to like make fun of chris christie uh having an unruly body let's say and i just find it so gross and i hope that that is changing like definitely not changing fast enough but like i think it's fucked up for anyone to make fun of anyone's body and i think 
it's probably not more acceptable to make fun of men's bodies. Like I think the people that would make fun of Chris Christie would make fun of like anyone else's body as well. I think is way more acceptable to talk about dudes bodies. I really I think, do I, not. I, maybe again, I mean, maybe like the, the people that you're hanging out with in New York, but I think <sighs> most people are totally cool being like, look at that woman's ass, you know, like blah, blah, blah. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm saying, I'm saying a blog will be written about, the comment about the woman's ass or the fat joke about wh- whichever woman, uh, A.D. Bryant, right? Someone wants to make fat joke about A.D. Bryant. There's not, you, th- there's not the same amount of outrage when they're making fun of Chris Christie, even if he, you know, was a decent human being. I think you are setting up a straw man and we're, it's just like a Jezebel post is not the same as like widespread culture where people make fun of women's bodies and where women are like, I, I understand what you're saying that it's like, it would be great for like everyone to not have to face that kind of sure body shame but it's far worse for women especially because women (laughs) those women in a bar in murray hill while you may perceive them to have a lot of power because you want to fuck them and they might not want to fuck you like men in culture that's not all by the way the angle i'm coming from okay well i you're also talking to the guy where where you google the word manorexic i'm on the front page (laughs) no really yeah no okay okay um make make zero assumptions about me because you'll probably get surprised yeah uh but all i mean to say is like like men literally have all the power in society right like men have more more money men have all this access to like halls of power every single man that's ever been president is a man like Mm. most of congress is men like men have power in society in a way that women demonstrably do not and like that is important even though there are many situations in you know like interpersonal situations in which it may seem that a woman has more power and she may in fact have more power like that is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like cultural power. Yeah, no, that I get. Yeah. But at the end of the day, and this is, I think, similar to when we talk about how liberals spoke to the Midwest in 2016. Yeah. When you're talking to the 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 dude in you know Western Pennsylvania who and right. he's being like he was struggling to make ends meet, and then you keep yelling privilege at him. It's like at the end of the day, like yes, these are big, broad cultural things, but sometimes like there's still people at the end of the day in these practical situations. Where but, like, yeah, a, a what some people would say a gross looking guy could come in or gross w- looking women. If you make the comment about her, people are going to generally be upset in that practical situation. And if there's a guy who looks kind of weird or like think about how many times you can just call a guy creepy. And I'm not I'm not <laughs> uh, hashtag not all mending mending this. I just I, you just happen to catch me on a, yeah. on a day. But uh, it, it's. It, yeah, yeah. I would just I, say it's it's definitely more acceptable to talk shit about a dude's body. Yeah. And I would say that the body positive movement, which should include everybody, and it slowly is, but like there, there's no Dove campaign for dudes yet. Yeah, but I think Dove is extremely patronizing and has tried to like commercialize and like turn feminism into like right. capitalism. But you know what I'm trying to say though? Is, I, I, fundam- I think we just fundamentally disagree That's on okay. this and there's no way that we can prove it because we don't have statistics <laughs> in front of us. No one has done a longitudinal study of people making fun of people's bodies in bars. Sure. So this we may have to agree I'm, to disagree. As current fact checker and, and former <laughs> fact checker, yeah. uh, I, I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah. uh, three years fact checking at celebrity gossip magazines will fucking do that. Wow. Yeah, I got into an argument over a hyphen once and I wanted to blow my brains out. What was the argument? Uh, I uh, have like a faux argument with the copy department of like, well, you know, it's Kaylee Cuoco sweeting now. We have to do Kaylee Cuoco sweeting, not Kaylee Cuoco because she's married on her yeah. social. She does hyphen sweeting and you know on imdb she now hyphen sweeting and also like you know maybe i shouldn't be alive because i'm having this <laughs> yeah. argument this is ridiculous yeah yeah um and then she got fucking divorced and i was like that argument was for nothing uh, I, <laughs> yeah um <laughs> but so so you you're in high school and you're carrying around makeup that yeah. you don't actually want to use and you're this, yeah. keeping track of a diet that you seem to i don't know like want to do not do or I mean, it's just like, you know, I performed a lot of or like tried to fit a certain I did a lot of like, uh, what am I? How do I formulate this thought? I did a lot of things that were like actions aimed at like fitting a beauty standard until I it took me a long time to be like, I don't need to like have a certain look a certain pre-described way like i can just look how i look um which is a tough like we're so there's this whole like 
beauty myth thing where we're all trying to fit this like very uh like a victoria's secret model ideal uh and then there's also this like self-esteem culture where Mm. we're like you know girl power like we should all feel good about ourselves all the time which is kind of like a super fucked up response to that and probably coming from a good place of people just wanting kids to feel good about themselves but it's like when you live in a culture that is designed to systematically tell you that you are worth less or worth Mm. nothing um you can't just like pull yourself up by the bootstraps and feel good about yourself all of a sudden. It's almost like Sheryl Sandberg lean and feminism type of how to feel good about yourself. Like you can't just do it alone. You have to fix the culture and it takes a lot of work. Um, it's like putting a bandaid on like a uh, like, bullet yeah. wound. Uh, so, which I think is maybe a Taylor Swift lyric. Oh, no. uh, yeah, I know. So yeah. So it was just like, it took a long time to realize like why, where that like there's so many women are like i hate my body or like even though i you know am successful blah 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 there's always like these nagging body issues and it took a long time to realize what the depth of that was from like why to my core i felt uncomfortable with my body or scared of it or like hated it and realizing it was coming from a place completely divorced from reality helped me like begin the long journey of being like truly fine with who i was and like in high school i was anorexic i had all this makeup under my bed that i like hated and never really used and just kind of stressed me out and like which is not to say that no one should wear makeup it's just like people should do what makes them comfortable and gives them joy and it wasn't making me comfortable or making me happy um yeah so just it took reading that book and thinking a lot and like slowly moving the needle forward of just feeling like i can look however i want to look it doesn't matter like I have realized recently that like the like whenever I do feel like oh I'm gonna like I used to apply heat to my hair a lot this is so boring it's bad for your so, hair to like straighten it um I does used to, it like, look like I know what's good or bad for my hair <laughs> yeah. uh I'm like I, even <laughs> I try on the journey of learning what is good for my hair uh and I just realized that like the correlation of like there was no correlation between me feeling like my hair looked good or I was like having a hot day to like how any men responded to me which should not be like the arbiter of your worth but i just was like oh why am i i'm doing this because i want to look good for men but they don't give a shit you know so just like there was it helps me be you finally like, saw like oh it actually doesn't matter yeah it literally does not matter i'm and yeah. how old were you when you got that this realization was like last year i was like why am i doing my no one gives are a you shit. like late ish 20s I'm, I'm trying to gauge i'm 28 oh yeah i'm just getting context yeah, yeah i'm 29 yeah. I'm going through that right now, or I've been yeah. going that for through years, but like even more, especially now, as I keep hitting higher and higher, my biggest weight ever, so to speak. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, oh my god, I'm weighed the most I've ever weighed in my life, and then like you know, six months later, it's like now I weigh them. <laughs> yeah. right? But like, people still are making the mistake of having sex with me, <laughs> yeah. and yeah, I'm so frustrated because I'm just like, you're disproving this whole concept. That I have to be like in shape or something. And I've attached my mind to that. Right. I've endured so much bullying over this. Yeah. It needs to be true. Otherwise, all that pain was worthless. Yeah. Um, and so I'm still trying to figure that out. And and like, yeah, like two days ago, I got on the scale most I ever had in my life. And there's a couple people. I had a super like, quote unquote, typically hot comic who was like, out of the bl- out of the total blue, just messaged me and was like, you're very cute. And I'm like, ah! wait, what? Like, yeah. And not in a, what? No, I'm like, what? you're wrong. Like, this Uh-oh. is, like, yeah. you might be right when I'm in a certain eight, weight range. There's times when I'm definitely cuter. There's, I shouldn't say yeah. times. There are weights where I'm definitely cuter. <laughs> and and then I wouldn't push back. So I'm having a hard time accepting that, like, oh, I can be beautiful at any size. Yeah. And so, you know, when I joke around, like, on stage, I'll do stuff in the idea of, like, oh, no, body positivity is great and you can be beautiful at any size. But body shame me. I need you to body shame me. Don't accept me at this. Otherwise, I'll never work out. Yeah. And it's just so weird when you see that, like, all this shit we obsessed over doesn't actually matter. Yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah. It's it's liberating. Is it? And do you do how do you you do feel liberated from that? Yeah. Like, I spend all yeah it just it used to be something i thought about all the time mm-hmm. all the time all i would think about is like 
my weight and like what I was going to eat next and what I just eat and blah, blah, blah. And now I just can think about so many other things. And they're all stupid. Like, <laughs> usually it's like, I woke up this morning and What are you both, replacing those thoughts with? Right. I'm like, <laughs> literally today I was like, I've spent all day today thinking about how I woke up this morning and both of my eyelids were swollen because I think... It is again so boring. And like, congrats to the listeners. It, none for of this has today. been boring. Okay, <laughs> I so yeah, I started using a new acne medication last night. I got my. No, I know, no, I know, no, I know. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. And I think it. Yeah, I think it's. But yeah, I'm like that's what I think about now, <laughs> and crushes, I guess. Okay. Yeah. What else? God. Have I, you have you seen a change in your dating li- dating or sex life since your uh, your liberation? I mean, I was a very late bloomer, uh, so I. I mean, as I've learned more about feminism, my dating life has gotten better, but it's really only because like that's how time works. And as I continue to learn about feminism, time moves forward. And as I date more people, time moves forward. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I don't know that there's necessarily a correlation, although I would not be surprised if there were. See this now my dumb opinion on the like as you learn more about feminism like dating got easier you said yeah see i just feel like it would get harder because i have so many more like barriers to entry well i yeah so i disagree because like i'm obviously not going to date a republican right like that was never going to happen so like the people that would be weirded out by me writing a book called how to date men when you hate men were already not people i was going to date right so like that's not changing anything and then like it just like how do i want to i'm like trying to formulate this thought as i say it i think there's something to like knowing who you are that's like not attractive but just like lets me be more i don't know i'm like hesitant to can be I, like be this way and it will make you more attractive to people can can i maybe rephrase my question then yeah yeah, if yeah. It's, so maybe it's not that it got uh more difficult yeah because maybe the thought is, oh, it's easier because I know who I am. And so it's easier to just nix people. I'm like, oh, no, this is fine. Like, it's, it's, it's an easier, you have more, fil- an easier filtration system. Yeah. I should rephrase that as like, did you find that you're dating your sex life um, either like slow down or there are less people you are interested in because the more you learned, the less people you yeah, were interested in. Yeah, I was like, in. oh, that guy's a jerk. Uh, in ways that you didn't realize he before, was a jerk before. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think that like that. I mean, that's a good question. I think I like notice things now that I wouldn't have noticed before I sat down and thought about it for a long time. But I try to like bring those. It's again, like everything goes back to communication, right? So it's like when someone will do something like um, freaking out that I'm more successful than them then we just talk about it where it's like, I don't think you need to feel that way. I think that's like something that is um, like something that you're taught by culture that doesn't yeah. actually mean anything. Yeah. Someone that I thought I had a crush on and in fact did have a crush on uh, <laughs> told me this summer that this was before we had made out. I was like the first time we were hanging out at his house alone. He was like, I could never date anyone who is funnier than I am. And I was I like, I don't get that. I know. I, it, it pains me. Because I know. I, I kind of, I really want someone yeah. funnier and more successful because one paying less two makes me <laughs> laugh. Yeah. Um, that, that boggles my mind when yeah. I hear this needs i need to be more successful like i get where it comes from but like really still yeah so before like when people would say something like that to me or say uh the correlative which is like i couldn't be with someone who was more successful than me i would just be like they don't like me and they're trying to tell me they don't like me but with this new guy i was basically like you were saying that because you're sexist like i think there are i don't think i phrased it that way but i was like i think (laughs) there are sexist undertones to what you're saying that you are not considering and i would love you to examine why you are saying something like that and he was you know kind of defensive and like didn't think he was saying it for a sexist reason but just like even so he and i never dated he just sends me um screenshots of his conversations with women on hinge for me to uh analyze for him now so that's our relationship. so he asked for your help yes exactly okay yeah uh but yeah you just, charge for that help i she, she i honestly should <laughs> yeah. that labor. i know uh but yeah it's just it's so to answer your question it's like not harder to date men it's just i talk to them about these things right instead so, of being like fuck you that's a deal breaker we're breaking up it's like why don't we because again it's like how do you change your culture without 
changing individual people. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you've so you've actually gone through the phase that I guess I thought you were in, which was, oh, like there's less men that you would see yourself dating because you know more things. And now you're like, well, I'm at least going to engage in them. And like, do you see there's hope through that conversation to still potentially date that person? Or are you just trying to leave that person a bet, maybe a slightly more aware <laughs> person than you found them? No. So I think we live again, like this is water, right? Like it's not like there are I've, when the. Weinstein stuff started happening when Me Too started kicking off. I feel like there was a lot of rhetoric of like, these are the bad guys, like these are the good guys. And I don't think that is helpful in any any way. I don't think that's a helpful formulation because all men live in a culture that teaches them that they can treat women in a certain way, that women are less than fully human, less than full citizens. Uh, As I learned in this Heidi Strzok play, women are not mentioned until page 38 of the Constitution, uh, including the amendments. Mm -hmm. So... Like, it's not like we just will find all the bad men and then ship them to the moon. Uh, all men are like this. And I wouldn't be surprised. I would, I, you know, started saying this at the beginning of the Me Too movement. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if something came out about my dad or my brother, men that I love unconditionally, just like because all men are taught that they can do this. And I feel like I personally, since then, have had a couple people that I was close to uh, be Me too in a way. Mm. Like, been like lost their jobs or like become like people were talking about ways that they had treated women and like i feel like to a far lesser extent it's the same with men that i'm dating where it's like all men i'm not gonna find one man who like was raised in a cave and wasn't ever conditioned to treat women there are, there's no perfect yes man, exactly extends extended to there are no perfect people but like yeah there's exactly. no perfect man yeah. out there that's never done anything bad to a woman or never said anything or thought anything sexist exactly it doesn't exist yeah so it's like and this is like like a really you this, there's this book by rebecca traster called good and mad that, rebecca traster everyone go follow her on twitter really yeah follow. <laughs> yes yes yeah. uh and she writes in her book like one of the reasons that the women's rights movement isn't like a constant why it really only seems to catch fire once every 50 years is because you're navigating these intimate so it's called relationships fire twice what yeah <laughs> so i mean there's sorry, like sorry. <laughs> yeah. you don't have to get into that it's just that was interesting yeah i mean sorry. there's like second wave and then there's like right now clearly a <laughs> resurgence yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but it's just like uh yeah you're navigating these really intimate relationships with not only your lovers but your dad your boss blah 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 so it's like but you have to really commit to the cause so it's like i'm a feminist a hundred million percent i also like date men and i don't want to you definitely could be like a political celibate but i don't want to uh, so like political celibate just where there was this thing called like uh i want to say you read so many think pieces yeah yeah, yeah. No, well yeah no i just <laughs> you know all the cool buzzwords yeah, yeah yeah uh god what was it there was in the second wave movement there was this like sect of women oh. who were like you should only date women so they were like lesbians for political reasons sure. which i think uh, okay, is wildly offensive um and dumb but like i'm like okay i get if you just don't want to date anyone because of your politics but i d- don't think that's necessarily useful and i d- don't want to not date anyone so yeah you do have to commit to being like open-hearted and talking to men about this and i think most men uh like probably will be a little bit defensive when called out but like I was on this podcast with uh, Anna Marie Cox, who started Wonkette, and she was like, when I bring this up to my husband, who like does have different politics to me, the reason that he can hear it is because he knows that I love him unconditionally. And I feel like that really is one of the best ways to like change a culture is to like talk to the people you love about this and like and not strangers on Twitter that you don't love. Exactly. Who know you don't love them. Yes. And now nothing got fixed. At yes. least the person knows you're coming from a genuine place. Yes, exactly. 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 So yeah. So that's the long answer to your question of how do I date with these feminist beliefs in my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's wild. Um, yeah, it, 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 the talking thing. And do you have your own like? So again, you've gone through the stage of like, well, now this everything's a deal breaker. Like you have to be perfect or else. And now you've gone to a realistic stage yeah. where you're like, you have to manage what you're okay with and what you're not with, and maybe what he's evolving on and not there yet. Do you have like certain deal breakers that are like firm nose? And then do you have stuff where you're like, these are opinions that I know are out there, and if I come across them, I can work with that. Uh, I, so A, I don't think I ever really went through a phase where I was like, all men are bad, everything's a deal breaker, sure. because I, it's such a recent development that anyone wants to 
date me. Like I, it really was just like really? trickling in. Yeah, I. All the nervous hipster boys on the L train <laughs> yeah. aren't like flocking to you. Yeah, uh, you're like was, their dream girl. <laughs> right for the New Yorker, you wear Converse, like yeah, you have yeah, clear yeah. glasses. What? <laughs> <laughs> These glasses are not usually on. I'm only wearing them because of my aforementioned swollen eyelids. You're very Brooklyn bumble <laughs> chic. I'm just saying. It's like, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I guess. I mean, it probably also goes. It comes back to like, was I in a place where I was like ready to date? And probably maybe not. Although maybe I'm just selling out my former self and she was totally ready to date. Sure. Uh, but yeah, so I never really was like, no men for me right now. Like they're all bad. Uh, and I don't, I definitely don't have a list of like, I wouldn't date someone who like voted for Trump. Right. Like I wouldn't date like a rapist, but I don't think I necessarily have maybe it's like so unconscious that it's like happening without a list. Um, but yeah, definitely like no Republicans, but I don't think I know a th- opinion where if I found a man who believed that I would uh, be like, we have to break up. Although, but maybe if it was a compilation of, of, things, cer- of yeah. things from that category. Yeah. 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 I could see it. You're like, look, it's fine if it's X and X, X and Y, but if it's like X, Y, Z, A and B, it's like, dude, this is too, pro- this is too much. For yeah. Me. And again, it's just like case by case. We'll see. I mean, sure. I just recently was interested in someone who, uh, <laughs> who sent me a f- selfie near his car and like, uh, I noticed a giant Bernie bumper sticker and I had to sit down with him. He lives in Wisconsin and I was like, I know you voted for Bernie in the primary. That's totally fine. That's everyone's right. Who did you vote for in the general? Right, that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. and he was like Hillary. So I was like, okay, good. It's like, good boy. Yeah, yeah. If he had said <laughs> Trump, definitely I would have been like, I have I have to go. Uh, and if he had said no one, I don't know, I would have had to deal with that. Probably uh-huh. maybe would have had to go. Um yeah, so I mean, well, it's all, you know, nothing's like a, we all contain multitudes, right? Like, sure. I don't have any like, still, quote, still quoting, <laughs> yeah. still making quotes. It's the yeah. only one I actually knew. Yeah. <laughs> nice. That book's somewhere in there. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Poetry I still, shelf. Um, no, yeah, I, I kept the Walt Whitman, I think, from high school. I think it's somewhere maybe by where Blink is, man. Oh, it's nice. in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember because, uh, oh, God, that was the only one I remembered from high school. Yeah. Uh, and I just listened to a whole podcast episode about Walt Whitman in Brooklyn. Really? Um, it's a show called Bowery Boys. Oh, that sounds uh, great. So it's a New York history podcast, and they had to, they do whole episodes about like people, places, and stuff. In the city, and they did all about Walt. All about yeah. Walt. And I was like, oh, that's good. Anyways, um, <laughs> well, uh, Blythe, you're uh, very fun and engaging to talk to. <laughs> and so I'm going to ask you something, and you're totally welcome to say no and shoot that down. Okay. Very fun. Um, would you be down to do like a little 10 to 20 minute bonus episode sure. for the Patreon people? Um, I had an idea that I will run by you, and okay. you can shoot it down or not, but we could, uh, you can see, let's discover how sexist is Billy. Oh, okay. Does that sound fun or do interesting? Do I have to, to have you? like pre? Do I have to have questions or do you have questions? I have no question. I just thought it was like, oh, what what would be an interesting bonus? Yeah. And okay, uh, we can figure this out. That, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. we'll figure that out. Yeah. Patreon people, you hear that tomorrow. But for now, where can people find you? Where can they buy your book? Uh, oh yeah, okay. My book is available wherever books are sold. And it's called How to Date. Men yeah, when How to you Date My Money Hate Men, but not at the airport. Unless it's the Milwaukee airport. Wait, do you already know that it won't be in airports? Um, Has I'm this like, been like confirmed? <laughs> yeah. We're, like, we're going to be in airports, right? Yeah. Mm, no, couldn't get it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I kind of like kept my eye out. I like fly a lot, which in 40 years, people are going to be like, how dare you have flown so many times when you knew about climate change? Uh, but yeah, so I noticed that it's not in airports. And I was like, duh, of course they wouldn't have it in airports. It's so offensive to stupid people um, <laughs> so. you know what that was ableist um, <laughs> d- d- don't you hate that like uh, now we can't hate we can't call people stupid that's I, dumb <laughs> yeah 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 i've been trying to use crazy and insane but, but, less, the, but also I use them equal, constantly equally equally offensive as stupid or dumb i yeah it's just like i get <laughs> why i all I, it's I get like, why, but I'm also I get like, why, but I'm also down. like so. I everyone I know is struggling with mental health issues, and no one has ever been like it's offensive that you say crazy or insane. But I also don't want to diminish anyone who does feel offended by it. So I'm I mean, you're to allowed to less. be offended by it, but it's called take offense for a reason. That is a you problem. <laughs> Like you have the offense and I'm sorry you feel bad. Doesn't mean I got to change my actions yeah. when it's maybe affecting like a whole group of people at once maybe. Whole yeah. Time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the book is how to date men when you hate men. What can they follow you on the internet? Oh if yeah. If you'd like to. Uh, Twitter and Instagram. My handles at Blythe, B-L-Y-T-H-E, like happy. 
It's a stupid handle, but Blythe, the word in English means happy, or at least it used to. Now it means casually indifferent. So are you, is, is it possible that you're too smart for the internet? <laughs> I I'm think just... everyone is too smart for the internet. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for talking to me, and I'm looking forward to finding out how sexist I am. But uh, <laughs> why don't you go ahead for now say goodbye to people. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening. All right. Quick, quick little fact check uh, here. Uh, I did say uh, that a third of young boys uh, manage their weight with disordered eating habits and I could not immediately find that number, but I did find these statistics. I'll, I'll briefly round, uh, rattle off for you from the nationaleatingdisorders.org website. Hospitalizations involving eating disorders for male patients increased by 53% uh, from 1999 to 2009. Uh, amongst all people who have eating disorders, men represent anywhere from 25 to 36% depending which particular eating disorder we're talking about. And this one might be a surprise for some of you, but uh, the majority of males with eating disorders are straight men. Big shock. I'm not, but maybe you are. So uh, I will push back on Blythe with that, uh, just only because we don't talk about it as much. Not to say we shouldn't talk about women's and the beauty standard. I'm saying there's also a beauty standard for men. And yes, I do get to have the final say because uh, it's my podcast. So <laughs> there is that. Uh, all those things she mentioned, by the way, I've, I put links in the show notes. Uh, Caitlin Moran, the beauty myth, all that stuff is in the show notes. Go check that out. And of course, of course, of course, go check out Blythe's book, How to Date Men When You Hate Men. If you want to hear some more with me and Blythe Roberson, she has a bonus episode coming out on Patreon tomorrow for all of my $5 and up fan whores. Again, the link for that is patreon.com slash podcast. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter at TheBillyPresita. Uh, if you need more updates about the show, head on over to manwhorepod.com. That's got all the things you're going to need over there. And if you want to shoot me an email with your comments, your questions, your feedback, your, your nudes, uh, your dick pics that have my name written on them, you can send those over to manwhorepod at gmail.com. Last call, last chance for Tour de Manhor, everybody. You just got a few days left to activate your city. Detroit, Dallas, Chicago, Miami, D.C., Philly, Pittsburgh. I'm looking at you, folks. I feel like you guys are the cities that could really happen. Head on over to manwhorepod.com slash tour. Get your city today. And, uh, hey, if it doesn't work out, you get your money back. So, one more time, manwhorepod.com slash tour. Next week, I've got a, uh, a heavy episode with my ex, the genderqueer one, the one who had not been named, Shay. We're going to get into it with Shay next week, uh, but till until then, everybody, stay slutty. I'm a Patreon supporter of the Man Orc podcast, and I believe I've been one for about three or four years. Now, I started listening to the Man Orc podcast when Billy was interviewing his exes, and uh, I found those discussions to be pretty funny, but, but also responsible. And also, like, some of them were really emotionally raw. Now, since then, the Man Orc podcast has evolved to cover a broader range of topics with an array of interviews. Um... I am a straight white guy, and this podcast has really helped me get exposed to different lifestyles, views, and preferences, and that is awesome. Um, that's why I became a Patreon member to support Billy, uh, as he's you know focusing so much time and attention on the Man Howard podcast and really trying to make it as great as it can be. And also, because I'm a Patreon member, I now have access to the Champagne Room with all these really cool people. Uh, they're always in there swapping stories, bouncing ideas off each other, getting advice, sharing pics, and people are like always like affirmative and helping people like feel positive about themselves. And it's a great community of like-minded people with a lot of tattoos. If you're like me without a tattoo, you will stick out a little bit, but you're going to find good people in there. Anyway, uh, become a Patreon member of the Man Work Podcast. You will not regret it.